Hello, welcome to Rough Cut Cosmology. In today's cosmology news, we have Tessa Baker, a researcher at Queen Mary University in London. She will be telling us today about measuring the speed of gravitational waves using space lasers. Uh, this really is true. The current way that we detect gravitational waves are using lasers on Earth, where you have one beam going one way and then another laser beam going another way. And as the gravitational wave moves past, it stretches and expands space in such a way that when the laser beam gets back from the two different arms, it's slightly out of phase and you see an interference pattern that tells you a gravitational wave has gone through or some other form of noise which you remove and then eventually you can be confident you've seen a gravitational wave. The one that Tess is talking about today, it doesn't exist yet, but when it does, it'll be in space. It needs to be in space for reasons that she will talk about in the video, but it really is space lasers. Uh, I'm a little worried about scaring you off with what I'm about to tell you, but I just want to remind you that the goal of rough cut cosmology and cosmology news in particular is to bridge the gap between the more popular level stuff that you can find all over the place, really high quality, and the actual scientific papers to give you an insight into the cosmology that's being done as it's being done. It's a bit like the metaphor I think in my head is a sports analysis show for those who need more than just watching the game or the highlights, but want to kind of know behind the scenes what's going on. So don't worry if you don't take it all and just enjoy learning whatever you do. Uh, the more you follow and watch, the more you'll gradually remember stuff and, and pick more and more up. But enough from me, here is Tessa. So I've brought along a paper that I published a couple of months ago with some collaborators. And this paper is asking how well we can measure the propagation speed of gravitational waves. So that's how fast they travel with a particular gravitational wave detector that will be in space called LISA. So let's take a step back from the results and, and maybe you can give us some background about what is LISA, why does it have to be in, in space? I've heard of these other gravitational wave detectors that are on Earth. What's special about LISA and how can it measure the speed of, of, a, of a gravitational wave? Why is it that cosmologists are keen to do this? What do we find interesting about it? To understand why LISA needs to be in space, we have to think about what produces gravitational waves. Um, so gravitational waves are produced by the most energetic events in the universe, because it takes a lot of energy to, to shake up space and produce these, these tiny waves. And those energetic events are the mergers of black holes. There are actually two kinds of black holes that we know about. So there are relatively small ones, uh, where small means maybe sort of five to a hundred times the mass of our own sun, so it's actually really big. And there might be thousands of those in every galaxy in the universe. But then there are also really big black holes, things that are, are millions of times the mass of our sun. Um, and those live at the centers of galaxies. And each galaxy might only have one, or it might have two of those that are orbiting around each other and, and producing these gravitational waves. And the point is these two kind of different, different varieties of black holes, they produce what we would call different frequencies of gravitational waves, where frequency basically means how fast the gravitational wave oscillates. So we have gravitational wave detectors already on the ground, and they are designed to detect what we would call the high frequency gravitational waves. So the fast ones that come from the small black holes. But in order to detect the gravitational waves from the, the really, really big guys, ones that happen at much lower frequencies, we need a completely different kind of detector. And it turns out that detector has to be really big uh, to make it sensitive enough. So big, in fact, that we can't really fit it on Earth. So we have to go into space. I see. And, and this is because of um, there's a relationship between the frequency and the, the wavelength of the wave. Is that right? And so as the frequency changes, the, the wave, the size of the wave gets larger and therefore you need this, this larger detector. Right. So, so that, that's one effect. Also, to, to get um, something really sensitive, you need uh, even, even longer arms of your detector. Yeah. Okay. And is that also, be, I, I would imagine being in space means that any wobbling that might happen if someone walks by or a train goes by or a car drives by for all of these ground-based detectors, hopefully in space there's no one walking past wobbling the detector. Is that playing a part as well? So there's a different set of challenges. You're right that there's no kind of seismic tremors or, or lorries or anything to, to deal with. But of course, there is, you know, radiation from the sun and the fact that you can't just send an engineer up there with a screwdriver to fix something. I, I thought it might be interesting to 
dwell a little bit on this why you need something so explosive to create <clears throat> a gravitational wave i guess naively we normally think of gravity as quite a strong force because it's so present in our lives holding us down on the earth but i, I find a really good thought experiment to kind of really grasp how weak gravity is is that at the moment i am being pulled towards the center of the earth by the entire mass of the entire earth which is a lot of mass meanwhile my chair which is one tiny little chair is stopping me from falling so the electric and magnetic forces and sort of chemistry forces inside my chair are resisting the entire gravitational effect of the earth so i guess this is why when you have colliding black holes you need something so explosive because so the gravitational force that will produce the rippling of space is so weak that even with something so explosive it's still a very a small thing and then we have to detect that so with our detectors that are detecting the weakest force you you need to be ultra sensitive so the size of the gravitational wave needs to be as big as as possible i guess so something as explosive as colliding black holes is is necessary yeah that's exactly right sort of getting back to the the story so that's why we have the the lisa detector that'll be in space and and we're looking for these low frequency uh, gravitational waves and we want to measure their propagation speed so why is that interesting this all relates back to a, a big problem in in cosmology which is we have some some problems with our standard cosmological model right when we look at all our observations they tell us that the expansion rate of the universe is speeding up and that's something that's actually really quite difficult to explain with all the, the standard physics we have, so standard laws of gravity and the kinds of, of components that we think the universe has. So either we have to invent some really kind of crazy exotic new component to the universe that's never been detected, which we call dark energy, or an alternative would be that maybe the laws of gravity that we're kind of using to deduce all of this aren't, aren't quite right. So we have a standard theory of gravity, which is thanks to Albert Einstein. And we, we know that works really well on Earth and in the solar system and probably even in the galaxy. But it's not clear that it applies to the universe as a whole. And so uh, people are very interested in testing whether there could be a, a different theory of gravity governing the universe. And it so turns out that one of the ways you might be able to tell whether that's happening would be that if you had a different theory of gravity, it might change the speed at which those gravitational waves themselves travel. So in our, our standard gravity, there's a clear prediction for that. And it says gravitational waves travel at the same speed as light. But if we go to one of these kind of new gravity theories, that might not be the case. So going and trying to measure the, the speed of gravitational waves will enable us to learn something about some of these other gravity theories. Are they viable or, or are they not? Right. And, and is, has the current gravitational wave detections that have been made, have they made any progress on that front? Have they on measuring the speed of gravitational waves, these, these uh, Earth based detectors? Yes, indeed, they have. So there was a, a really, really kind of exciting result um, back in 2017. Uh, when the ground based detectors, they detected a merger of two things called neutron stars. So those are uh, dead stellar cores that so they're almost black holes, but they're just not quite big enough to kind of collapse and form black holes, but they're still really, really big. And they're made out of neutrons, I guess, given the name. <laughs> they are indeed, yeah. So that, that's like the, the densest thing you could form in the universe before collapsing to a black hole is basically a big ball of neutrons. So we saw a merger of those two things, both with the gravitational wave detectors, and also we saw bright flashes of, of light, that, you know, electromagnetic radiation that were given off by the same event. And from timing the arrival of those two things, so the gravitational waves and the photons, that, tell, that enables you to uh, measure any differences in their speed. And so this, this measurement of the propagation speed of gravitational waves was done with that event. And we found that, uh, at least with that one event, it seemed to be really, really close to the speed of light, so a, you know, a really, really tiny degree of accuracy. But the, the subtlety here comes that that measurement used those, well, they weren't black holes in this case, but it used those small objects and the high frequency gravitational waves. And we've actually got kind of good theory, theoretical motivation that says, even if you see something traveling at the speed of light with the high frequency gravitational waves, you could still have something very non-standard going on with the low frequency gravitational waves. And that's the thing we're after. And, and the, the changing of speed with frequency 
is something people might be a little familiar with with like prisms and light and stuff that if, if i if i shine light through a prism the different frequencies of light which in this case means different colors of light travel at slightly different speeds which is why i mean which is why you get this pink floyd dark side of the moon rainbow coming out of the prism on the other side it would be i suppose a little bit like that but with gravitational waves that they're not we can't see them so they're not colors but the different frequencies would travel at different different speeds a little bit i it, it, they wouldn't bend the, I, I suppose the way that they do in um, a prism because the, the whole point with the prism is you're going from two different media the air to the prism and the, the speed change happens there but at least it would be similar in the sense that they'd be traveling at different different speeds cool and is there um is there any reason to suspect that the frequency lisa will be sensitive to is is one where we might have deviations or is it just a, a case of measuring as much as we possibly can so um if you dig into the kind of mathematics that underpins this this kind of model where you have deviations at the, the low frequency gravitational waves and not at the, the high ones that does make a kind of ballpark prediction and it makes a, a prediction that the transition from your different speed and back to the speed of light could happen um at, at well what we measure is at sort of a few hundred hertz so that's something that is just at the uh, sort of middle to lower end of the the ground-based detectors so in fact we think we've sort of just about kind of clipped that transition with the ground-based detectors and we're just on the wrong side of it with with those and so the the lisa detector should be cleanly out the other end in the low frequency regime i see so there's one one subtlety that maybe wasn't brought right to the front which is that it's not so much that the gravitational wave detector is measuring the speed of gravity it's more that it's measuring its difference with the speed of light so it's not like that it it's telling us the absolute speed that the gravitational wave is detect is, is traveling from one detector to the other it's just this difference in ar arrival time between a light signal and a and a gravitational wave that tells us you know if, if the light signal arrived a week earlier obviously it's traveling slightly faster if it arrived a week later it's traveling slightly slower is that is that correct is there any hope of measuring the absolute speed of gravitational waves right so this is a, a difference in method then between what's been done already with the ground-based detectors and what we do in this paper so in the ground-based detectors because they have that flash of light the the electromagnetic part of the signal exactly as you say sean they're just measuring a relative speed between light and the gravitational wave but when we go look at those um low frequency gravitational waves we're not sure if there is going to be that corresponding flash of light now there might be but there's it, it's a it's a very uncertain area so what we wanted to do in this paper was find a slightly different way to use the gravitational waves to to measure the speed one that doesn't rely on that light signal so actually in our case we are measuring the absolute speed not not just a relative speed let's get into the the details now so what, what was it specifically in this this new paper this is one of the, the things we want from you know the cosmology news channel is to, to give you our audience insight into the actual research being done so this, this is a paper that is only a few months old and um yeah before that i guess tessa and her collaborators knew all about it but no one else in the cosmology community did and now now we're sharing it with you so as we said earlier, what we want to try and do is measure the speed of propagation of, of the gravitational wave for, for all the things we've talked about. So when you're thinking about a wave, there are two parts to it. There's what we call the amplitude, which basically is you can think of as like the height of a wave. So if you think of a wave on the ocean, how tall is it sort of above the mean surface of the sea? So that's one part. And the second part, in technical jargon, we'd call it the phase. It, it basically tells you how fast does that wave oscillate so is it something very slow or is it something you know that, that goes up and down really quickly and both those those quantities exist for for gravitational waves so what we did in this paper we start off with the kind of the, the mathematics side of it we go back to the starting point of the derivation for what is the amplitude of a gravitational wave what's the phase of a gravitational wave and we kind of reworked those calculations with a, a, a different speed of propagation. And in particular, we used a, a, a speed of propagation that goes through a transition, as we talked about earlier. So starts at something different from light and then at some point goes back to being the, the speed of light. C can I just clarify something? You said the word phase twice where I think you meant frequency or am I missing something? Hmm. OK, so. The phase is a more complicated object, but what it really is telling you 
is that that frequency, which you're absolutely right, Sean, is sort of what you think of as how fast a wave oscillates. The phase is tells you how the frequency changes over time. So when you've got these two objects that are going to in spiral, uh, sorry, uh, they're going to, well, they're going to orbit around each other and get closer and closer until they, they merge. So as they in spiral, the gravitational waves they produce, they start off kind of slow, so low frequency. But as the black holes get closer and closer together, they get faster and faster. So the frequency goes up. And so the phase is really telling you about that whole evolutionary process of the gravitational wave. Yeah. OK, yeah. What are we looking at here? OK, so this is a, a diagram that's showing you the gravitational wave amplitude for a couple of different systems. So first of all, you've got that black line that kind of scoops down in a sort of bucket shape and then it has wiggles at one end that is showing you as a function of frequency what lisa can detect so anything that's above that line represents a sort of part of the parameter space that lisa can see and anything below it lisa can't see so i i don't know yet what the the like graph reading literacy of this channel will be um i i guess maybe we want to yeah so as you go from left to right you're getting larger values of frequency so, so that is meaning faster faster oscillations and and then this this y axis is the strength so the the higher you up there the the more the amplitude of of the wave is i guess and a sort of analogy for this would be like saying on your mobile phone maybe there's like a lowest sound it can play like the lowest note and there's like the highest note that it can play just you know due to the design of your phone and that's kind of what you're seeing spread out in the horizontal direction then it goes from lowest on the left to highest on the right and and this is what lisa can hear and yes the, the y-axis is then sort of showing the, the loudness if you like the strength of the signal so that solid black line lisa can hear everything that's above that okay and it can't hear below that so that's the black line and then we've got some kind of complicated set of things going on where there's you can see sort of three distinct sets of lines and they kind of split into red and green at one end. So what these represent are three different sets of black holes. And they go from the most massive, the heaviest ones on the, the sort of top left. You can see it says 10 to the seven. That means it's something that's um, 10 million times the mass of our sun. And there's one in the middle that's a pair of black holes that's one million times the mass of the sun. And then uh, there's a, a far one in the sort of bottom right that's a factor of 10 smaller than that. And what these tracks are showing is how that pair of black holes, as they in spiral and get closer and closer, they sort of move along that track, starting from the left. So we said when they're far apart, they're at low frequencies, emit low frequencies, so slow kind of gravitational wave oscillations. And as they get closer and closer, the frequency goes up, so they move to the right along that diagram and then you can see at some point there's like a, a bump and then the signal just drops off and what's happened there is there's been the last few seconds where the black holes have got so close they've devoured each other in a massive explosion of energy and then they vanish basically the signal's gone and you've just got one massive black hole sitting there in in space so that's what the three signals are now why there's why there are sort of green curves and red curves for some of them that's where our modified speed of propagation comes in. So in green, you have the standard prediction. So if we have normal gravity as given by Einstein, they follow the green track. But if you have this different speed of propagation that we spoke about earlier, they instead follow that red track. And you can see that the, the tracks are different but they're increasingly different for the heavier system in this case, so the one in, in the top left. Um, and so these are the kinds of signals that the kind of information we would get out of LISA from those gravitational waves would be effectively trying to kind of reconstruct this signal and work out which track an actual black hole system followed. And so LISA, yeah, LISA is observing over time this gravitational waves frequency changing and in, in, in a sense, almost like it is traveling along one of these lines. I, I guess um, w one thing I thought might be a, a nice Easter egg for, for the audience is that, as Tessa was saying, these, this is 10 million, 1 million, and then 100,000 times the mass of the sun. The, the, 
very observant reader might have noticed that there's this M and then like a little circle with a dot in it. So if, if ever you're reading any cosmological or astrophysical literature, almost always when you see that, it's telling you it's the mass of the sun. So then if you're, if you're reading something else and you see that, you can be, ah, I learned that that means the mass of the sun. So is it is the, I guess you've got one line here for the, what I guess in the caption says MG for modified gravity. Presumably, um, you don't know how big the deviation or the change from ordinary gravity is. So there's some whole population of, or set of possible dashed red lines. And then is the, is the ex possible size of this difference something that you do anticipate Lisa could, could tell? Like, can Lisa tell it's not the green line and is the red line for, for expected sizes of, of red line? Is that, if that makes sense? Yeah, that, that that's exactly right, Sean. So actually, that's one of the um, one of the things we want to measure is how big is that difference between the green and the red line. So in this picture, I've picked a particular value of that that difference just to uh, kind of make the the figure. Um, but actually, that will be one of the things we would try and 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 restrict. And so there's a, a parameter which describes um, that what it's actually giving you is the change between the speed of light, which you know gravitational waves have to have at the high frequencies, and their speed at the low frequencies. You know, is the difference like that, or like that, or like that? And there's a, a parameter describing that that height effectively. Cool. Anything more you wanted to say about this this figure? So not so much about this figure. This kind of shows the effects we're looking for. Um, and then what what we do in the paper is we kind of go through a set of procedures that allow you to say, okay, if we think Lisa is going to have these properties and this is the signal we're looking for, how well could Lisa detect those signals? How well could it measure that kind of parameter that I, I was telling about that described the, the change in speed? So there was um, a, another figure which shows the kind of results of that, which we could jump to. Okay, so, so what's going on here? So there's a couple of things. So first of all, in the horizontal direction, you've got the mass of the black holes you're studying. Now we've actually taken a log of it, which means we've sort of done a mathematical operation on it. So, but you can still think of things to, to the left being comparatively lighter black holes and things to the right being comparatively heavier black holes. And then in the, the vertical direction, there's a parameter we call redshift, which cosmologists use to say how far away something is. So again, things that are really near to us are low down and things that are really far away from us are, are at the top. This, this redshift thing relates back to, to what you said right at the beginning. Maybe it's nice to um, to just connect those dots, which um, you were saying the universe is expanding and and expanding at a faster rate over time, which is which is the mystery, which is what puts gets put under the label of dark energy, but that may in fact be modified gravity. But the fact that it's expanding does mean that this redshift is, is just a normal, it is very analogous to a normal Doppler shift that you might hear as a, a siren comes past you that things moving towards you sound at a higher frequency and things moving away are at a, a lower frequency. And so this, this redshift is the, the light wavelength being stretched at going to a lower frequency. I mean, so, so I guess going from a blue color to a red color as you move through the rainbow. And yeah, as, as Tessa said, because things further away are moving faster, they have more of a redshift. Um, and then it becomes an, an excellent observational proxy for uh, distance because um, it's such an relatively easily measured thing a lot more easy to measure and uh, ironically than distance itself yeah no that, that that's certainly true um particularly when you look at things like galaxies it's very easy to measure the redshift now the ironic thing is it's actually quite hard to measure the redshift of a gravitational wave source uh, but that's a perhaps a kind of story for another day so so this kind of parameter space shows um, where we might get observations from lisa so we have these massive black holes we might have light things at low redshift or at high redshift, we might have massive things at low redshift or at high redshift. So we're kind of covering all the possibilities. And it turns out the, the uh, extent to which we can measure that propagation speed, that kind of change we were trying to measure, depends on where our, our black holes come from and how big they are. And that's what the kind of gray curves in the background are, are showing you here. And basically darker gray means better measurement. So you can see the sort of darkest gray region is sort of in the intermediate masses, so middle of the mass range, but at, at low redshift, so quite close to us. And if we see a black hole there, then we'll get a really good measurement, um, you know, sort of 
of order a percent of a percent um, measurement on, on that change in, in speed. Whereas if we have something very far away, we'll, we'll have a harder time measuring that. But there's another set of curves overlaid on this. There's these kind of red bumps. You can see that kind of group towards the middle of the figure. And those um, measure how loud something is in Lisa. So there's a quantity we like to talk about, which is like signal to noise, which is how loud is the thing you're actually trying to detect over all the kind of background jitter in, in, in your experiment. And if you can see, there's numbers on them that increase towards, again, towards the bottom of the figure. And there's a sort of lowest one that says a thousand. And so things below that red line, again, which targets the nearby systems, those are the loudest. So our best bet at measuring this propagation speed will come from things that sit under that lowest red curve and also sit in the dark gray area. Those will give us the best measurements. Cool. It's lucky that I guess they, they coincide, but I suppose maybe it's, it's the, the same reason maybe they coincide that the loudest ones are, are perhaps the more easily measured. And, and I guess the reason why both of them prefer nearer is, is that just that the signal has had less distance to kind of attenuate as it, as it travels outwards from where it was uh, created? Is that why we prefer nearer things? Exactly that, yeah. So the, the, the size of your gravitational wave drops off as it travels. So the further away it is, the, the sort of quieter it, it, it sounds. So another interesting thing that jumped out to me here is the last figure you showed, the bigger the mass, the bigger the deviation. And I think you even said that. Um, now we see that you, you prefer this five point, which I think that, that is the five is, is 10 to the power of five. So 100,000 times the mass of the sun, if I'm reading everything correctly. Why, why is it that the 10 million times the mass of the sun one, despite having that bigger deviation, which you showed, isn't preferred here what's what's happening if that's an explainable thing no that's exactly like a great observation and that comes back nicely to what we were saying earlier when we we spoke about lisa having like deaf regions where she didn't she <laughs> anthropomorphizing here where it doesn't hear so well so um you're right that the most massive black holes have the biggest deviation but when we looked at those frequency curves on the the former figure they were sitting in a part where Lisa was getting worse again at, at hearing. So although it's the biggest deviation, we can't measure it as well. So there's a kind of trade off between these two effects that where we'll actually get the best measurement is a kind of sweet spot between where there's the greatest change to the signal, but also where we can hear the best. It feels like there might be an elephant in the room here, which is if such an event happens, it will give us lots of information. Do you know the relative like chances of events happening in this redshift and mass space? Do we actually expect at a redshift less than two and at a mass approximately five for an event to happen? Great question. And so this was also something we, we worried about when we were writing the paper, because you can't pin all your hopes on getting that perfect black hole in exactly the place you want it. So what we we showed in in the paper is that if you don't get lucky if instead of getting that one perfect black hole where you want it you get a, a, a much larger number of less good black holes so we think lisa will probably detect it's a bit uncertain but but maybe of order a few hundred of these merging black holes if instead you get a few hundred that are less perfect that's kind of equivalent to having the one perfect one in terms of your constraining power. So it's a little bit more of a messy measurement to do. You have to kind of wait till you've got those 100 events and then you have to combine the data from all of them, but you will get roughly the same results. So we were kind of pleased with that because it means the measurement's relatively safe. You know, either we get lucky or we don't, but either way, once Lisa flies, we should get the same, the same measurement roughly of the, the propagation speed. Cool. All right. Let's let's take a step back now. You told us right at the beginning about how this is all motivated by this dark energy thing, and maybe there's modified gravity. So let's let's just remind ourselves of that. We have this plot showing, yeah, the chances of if if we observe a black hole merger event at this particular mass and this distance from us, we'll we'll learn that the speed of gravity is slightly different to uh, the speed of light, or slightly different to what Einstein's theory of gravity the the currently correct 
working theory of gravity predicts. So what, what would this tell us if we, if we measure this about dark energy, about, about gravity? What would we have to, um, you know, would, would our GPS satellites stop working or would we be able to correct them in some way? What, what, what does it mean for cosmology and gravity if we find something here? Well, so the, there's, there's two possibilities, right? If we find something, then first of all, that's a, that's a massive revolution in physics, right? We've just proved Einstein wrong which would be, you know, major, major news. <laughs> At last, it only took us 100 years. Uh, I have to rewrite quite a few textbooks as well. Um, but we know, as I said earlier, that Einstein's theory works really well on Earth and in the solar system. So it's probably not going to, you know, stop your, your GPS working, but it would mark the start of a, you know, a massive new effort to understand the largest scales in the universe. And the hope then might be that some of the other things we don't understand about the universe, like you might have heard this, of this thing called dark matter, these kind of, we think the exotic kind of particle in the universe, maybe it'll give us some clues towards that. Maybe dark matter doesn't exist, but it's all, you know, some part of this new theory of gravity that, that we've understood. So that would be the incredibly exciting outcome. You know, on the flip side, we might find that everything is consistent with Einstein's theory of gravity. And whilst it's kind of less immediately exciting, that helps us as physicists, because then we know a whole bunch of ideas that people are working on right now aren't, aren't correct, right? These things that are, are predicting a different, different propagation speed. So that will rule out a whole bunch of models. And that means that, that theorists and, and physicists will then have to sort of think again, come up with new ideas. And that's the way science progresses. I don't know whether you're a gambling person or not, but if you had to give a probability of this parameter being measured so that the speed of gravitational waves being measured to be different to the speed of light by Lisa. What, first of all, I mean, there's two questions here. One, are, are you willing to answer this question? And two, if you are, what, what probability would you, would you give? I think it's a very hard question to put a number on because, you know, the, we grow up with like a status quo, you know, in our lives, but also as, as scientists. And so we're, we're sort of programmed and trained to think that things different from the status quo are, are really unlikely, right? Because the status quo is all we've ever known. But if we always think that way, we'll never discover new things. So you're really kind of tugging at, you know, two parts of what it, what it means to be a scientist there. So I don't think I'm going to put a number on it, Sean, sorry. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Right. Anything more that you want to kind of do to help us see where this, this work will fit in within the greater, um, I think I was calling it a jigsaw web in, in my notes to you guys that it's kind of like a jigsaw didn't feel quite right because jigsaw implies that stuff within the kind of jigsaw, the stuff that's happening here is unrelated to stuff that's happening over here. Whereas knowledge is more of a web where there's just connections all over the place between things, but then it's kind of an incomplete web. So it's kind of like if, if, if you had a jigsaw puzzle that was to build a web, that's what research is like. How, <laughs> so if that's not confusing enough, let's get back to the cosmology. And um, can you help us understand, uh, yeah, in, in, in any, anything else you want to say about how your, your research will fit within this, this jigsaw web? So I think it's important to put um, some kind of um, timeline on this. So Lisa, this mission we've been talking about, will be the first of its kind. It will be the first thing that can detect these massive, massive black holes. Um, but we have to wait for it for a little while, for 10 years, because the engineering involved is so complex. And so there's some things that could happen in the meantime, because these ground-based detectors that detect the small black holes, they are up and running. And actually, the, the, they sort of operate together as a network. And right now, that network is switched off. It's undergoing engineering and upgrades. But it's going to turn on again in March 2023. So, you know, about, about nine months from now. And when it turns on, it will be more sensitive than ever. So we'll start seeing even more of these small black holes. And although we've kind of done the speed of propagation measurement at, at those frequencies and with those systems, there's a whole bunch of other things we could learn from those. So if we ha did have a change to Einstein's theory of gravity, it's possible that it doesn't change the propagation speed, but it shows up in some other kind of way. And that has the potential to kind of completely change 
the landscapers as well. So I'm I'm super excited about uh, that switch on next year. Ah, yeah. So we don't have to wait necessarily for for Lisa to to have hope of um of seeing new stuff. No, exactly. <laughs>